glad you're here. So we're lucky today to have uh, Professor Josh Black uh, speaking with us about uh, the intersection of the Second and First Amendment uh, with respect to 3D uh, printing of guns. Um, so just real quickly, uh, Professor Blackman is an associate professor of law at South Texas College of Law in Houston, uh, and he specializes in constitutional law, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Uh, Josh is the author of a uh, book written and published in 2013 entitled uh, Unprecedented the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, uh, and also Unraveled Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power, which was in 2016. Uh, Josh has a great blog, by the way, if you want to check it out, you can find it at joshblackman.com. No one uses blogs when they use Twitter now. Oh? Really, it's true. Uh. At, at Josh and Blackman. <laughs> so you can follow him on Twitter. Much more popular. <laughs> and uh, Josh is the author of over four dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, and other national publications. So uh, join me in welcoming Josh. Thank you so much. It's great to be back here in Davis. Um, I have a, a knack for studying famous constitutional cases where they arose. Um, and yesterday I was in Denver, and that's actually where the Masterpiece Cake Shop was. And I went to go visit it. So after this, I'm going to visit the med school for a Bakke v. Board of Regents. So I always like to add to my roster of famous places. Uh, I have a treat for you today. You get not only one constitutional right, but you get two constitutional rights. How about the first? And the Second Amendment protect a right to 3D printed guns. So let's start basic. Has anyone here ever used a 3D printer? Yeah, what'd you make? An Asher? Okay, that's nice. How about you? What'd you make? Uh, me? I yeah. just made like a little figurine. Figurine? Who else? No one else? Okay. That's good. Not too bad. Okay. 3D printing is a way to design an object on a screen and convert it into a real life object. Uh, you can design an ashtray, or a figurine, or a car, or even a house on a computer. And a 3D printer lets you make that object a real life thing. Let's take a brief detour. Will I get arrested if I say learn how to code? What, does California put me in jail for that or no? Yeah. Not yet, not yet, okay. So hashtag, let's learn to code. Um, it's not that hard. If I want to make a cylinder, right, a tube, and I want to make a tube with a height of 20 and a radius of 5, you know what that means? 20 inches tall, 5 inches wide. And if I tell the computer, make a cylinder, the height of 20 and a radius of 5, that is what spits out. Okay? This is not complicated. With a few hours of training, I could teach you how to program a 3D printer using language and words and numbers that are completely easy to understand. You can use this technology to make lots of little trinkets, balls. This is a race car being printed on a 3D printer. You can print pieces of human anatomy. This is a model of a human brain, for example. How does a 3D printer work? It works the same way that you make a candle. Has anyone ever made a candle before, right? Okay, how do you make a candle? You take the wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax, you pull it out, you keep dipping it, right? And every time you dip it, it gets a little bit thicker around the base. 3D printing works in the same fashion. But instead of dipping something into wax, you're spraying. There's a little nozzle. You spray one layer at a time. One layer, one layer, one layer. And the object gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this little platform moves around. This picture shows the item from a different angle. Sometimes you have to heat the bed but the plastic doesn't heat, I'm sorry, doesn't cool right away. And this thing little spits around. All right, I wanna show you now a demonstration of how a 3D printer works. Here we'll be printing an object which you'll recognize in a moment layer by layer. Okay? Ready? Pay attention. Close attention. Number one. We start with this sort of honeycomb base. This is a very 
a strong and resilient structure with these hexagons, right? It's a strong and resilient structure to make an object. Okay? So number one. Number two gets a little bit thicker, right? Number three. Number four. You don't see it yet? Number five. Anyone see it yet? No? Number six. Anyone? Come on, Davis. Yeah? Frog. Close. You're on the right track. Very close. Six. He's a frog. Seven. Baltimore. You're in the ballpark. <laughs> Eight. What? Yoda. Ah, there it is. Give him the pizza. Yeah, that's a prize. It's Yoda. So you frog, you were close. Voldemort, not quite as close. But in the ballpark, right? Ah, uh, there it is. Everyone see it now? Yoda. 9, 10. There it is. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Right? You see the top being closed right off there. That probably took maybe an hour to print. Um, now, I'm not artistic. If you gave me a block of clay, I can't make that. If you gave me a block of wood, I can't carve that. If you gave me a piece of stone, Lord help me, I can't chisel that. If you gave me a 3D printer, I can make it, so can all of you, right? A 3D printer lets you take an object in your mind and bring it to reality. It's a way of using your own talents to create intricate items. So of course, we're in America, and what do people want to print? Guns, of course. Right? If, if all people were printing were Yoda busts, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Instead, we're talking about 3D printed firearms. Specifically, what made this issue rise to national and indeed international fame was the Liberator, the first fully functional plastic pistol. And this is the design of the Liberator. What the hell is this? This is the barrel of the gun, right? The thing the bullet comes out of. I have to, I'm in California, I have to explain these things here. Uh, when I give this talk in different parts of the country, I can assume, here I assume nothing. Uh, I, I'm from New York. I never touched a gun until I was 21 years old, so I can, I can relate. Um, the barrel of the gun is a cylinder. I played a trick on you. I showed you how to make a cylinder. If you can print a cylinder, a tube, you can print the barrel of a gun. They're not much different, just a little bit change in proportions. In 2013 and 2014, a group in Austin, Texas, named Defense Distributed, came on the map. Now, Defense Distributed made international waves. In full disclosure, uh, I represent them. I've been their lawyer now for almost five or six years. Uh, but they first created something that looks like this. This is the lower receiver for an AR-15, right? This is the guts that make a semi-automatic rifle work. And you can print your own fairly easily. They also 3D printed uh, the magazine. All right, this is the box the bullets go into. California, right? Uh, in fact, Cody, my, his favorite item he made was actually named after one of your former senators, the Dirty Diane, which is basically a silencer. Think, think of that for a minute. Yeah, after Diane Feinstein. There it is. Uh, but what put DD on the map, the global map, was this. What the hell is this, Josh? This is the Liberator, broken into different parts. It's a fully functional plastic pistol made entirely for printed parts. With the exception of this little nail, which is used as a firing pin, the thing that hits the bullet in the back, and the bullet. Of course, bullets are made of metal. Plastic bullets don't get you very far. Okay. This is what the Liberator looks like fully assembled, right? You have the sort of handle, you have the frame, you have a cylinder barrel, you got a trigger. You pull the hammer back. It's a one shot gun. Now, making a gun out of plastic is very stupid. It's not a good idea. Why? Plastic sucks. When plastic gets hot, it melts. When plastic cools down, it cracks. Guns heat up and cool down very quickly. Plastic is a very bad way of making a gun. That's why steel is so good. It heats, it expands, it cools, it contracts. Indeed, when you first started testing the Liberator, they were likely to blow up in your hand. If you see over here, there's like a rope on the floor. 
initially with these tests, they would put the trigger to a rope and they would stand very far away <laughs> and pull it. Why? So they would keep all their fingers. Fingers are helpful. Um, so, so the fear about plastic guns is really overblown. These are terrible guns. To even make it strong enough to withstand a combustion, you have to treat the barrel with this acetone bath to harden and strengthen the plastic. And again, if you screw it up, you'll blow your hand off. Right? This is not a good way of making a plastic gun. The additive materials are very weak. And people say, oh, Josh, technology advances. I've been working this case now for five years. Plastic hasn't gotten any stronger. We've more or less reached the point where plastic is as strong as it's going to get. It's not designed to make a gun. Indeed, the people who made these recognize these are not good guns. This is more of a philosophical and a moral project than a way of putting actual functional firearms in the hands of people. Okay? Anyway, this is what the library looked like in its completed form. So is there a problem? Right? Is it against the law? Oh, was that question at the end? Thanks. Is it against the law to 3D print your own weapon? Um, now, usually I say, is it against federal law? California, you guys are special. You're always special. There are certain California laws, which I'll get to later. But as a general matter, there's not a problem, right? People think, oh, 3D printed guns is like this. No, that's not what it's like. That's not how this works. And let me surprise you. It's very easy to make a gun. I might be abetting a crime right now in California, but I think I'll go ahead with it, right? I'll show you how easy it is to make a gun. I don't have any props here, I have pictures, okay? For example, this is called a zip gun. A zip gun is a homemade gun made from parts you can find in a hardware store. What is this? It's a soldering iron and a garden hose. That's it. For $10 worth of parts, a garden hose nozzle and a soldering iron, you can make a fully functional weapon. I found these photographs on the internet. This is a keychain flashlight that someone repurposed into a gun. All you need to make a gun is a tube that can withstand a blast. That's it. Now, I want to illustrate to you how easy it is to make a gun, how simple it is. Okay, how am I going to do this? Through these guys. Now, these guys are morons. Do not try this at home. Please, please listen to me. Don't try this at home. They're going to make a gun out of a rubber tube, a metal pipe, and a shotgun shell. And they're going to record it on their flip phone because they're really cool, right? How do you make a gun out of these parts? Simple. On the edge of this metal pipe is this little dimple. That's going to be the firing pin. They're going to load the shotgun shell into, come on in, into this rubber tube. Yeah, come on in. Come. Oh. Well, you can sit and watch then. <laughs> Lame. <sighs> Pathetic. Okay. Forgot something. Uh, so here's what they're going to do. They're going to load the, the shotgun shell into this rubber tube. And they're going to jam this pipe into the back of this tube. Okay. So let's take a step back. Reasonably prudent person, right? What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? A lot of things, but just give me one thing. Shout it out, come on. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. He's shooting you at a cardboard box. Indoors, yeah. It's even worse than that. Look what's behind this cardboard box. Here, the next picture shows a little more clearly. So there's an electrical outlet immediately behind the cardboard box plugged into a fan. Okay, so again, these guys are morons, right? But I want to illustrate to you how simple it is to make a gun. You need a $50,000 3D printer to make a lethal weapon. You don't. It's ready, they're gonna fire it. One, two, boom. Gun, right? No assembly, no manufacture, and these are all parts that you can buy at any hardware store. Really simple. Um, they take the shotgun shell, it's spent, you see it's smoking, they're all so proud. Um, they made a gun. Now, did these guys break the law? Um, there might be a law concerning uh, a prohibition on firing or discharging a weapon indoors. 
That's not my concern. Did the actual manufacturer of this weapon break the law? At least under federal law, the answer is no. Um, California law, the answer is probably. Uh, recently, California changed their regime. Um, they said to have a homemade weapon, you actually need to um, uh, have a serial number from the state, uh, which is not impossible to get. You can get one. Uh, but this gun with a serial number would probably be illegal in California. But in all other states, except for New Jersey, uh, what they did is perfectly lawful. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms has said that manufacturing your own weapon is legal. You can't sell it. If you sell it in interstate commerce, you're in trouble. But if you make it for yourself, it's perfectly acceptable. Then why am I even involved in this case, right? Josh, why are you here at a law school telling us about something that's perfectly legal? In 2013, Cody Wilson at Defense Tribute to put these files on the internet. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, we had a mass killing at Newtown School in Connecticut. At that time, the Obama administration put out a call saying, we want to find all the ways that we can use our existing executive powers to expand gun control. And one of the ways they did this was to go after uh, my client. And they said, it's a crime to put these files on the internet, right? We're not talking about the printing of the guns, but it's a crime to share the files online. Okay, this is where we came into the picture. We have both First and Second Amendment arguments about why this sort of law can't exist. Uh, let's start with the First Amendment, okay? The basic principle of free speech is that the government can't stop you from speaking. In some cases, they might be able to punish you after the fact for saying certain things. But they can't stop you from speaking in advance. Uh, this doctrine is what's known as a prior restraint of speech. The government can't impose a prior restraint on speaking. Now you might say, wait a minute, Josh. You're not just saying anything. You're giving people instructions on how to commit crimes, right? You're telling people uh, how to make an illegal gun, at least in some states. Well, that's not enough, right? There's a fairly long history of publishing materials that show you how to break the law. One of the most famous examples, or perhaps infamous examples, is the Anarchist Cookbook. You ever ever see this book before? It's basically a hand guide to be a terrorist. Uh, it teaches you how to make bombs, how to make poison, how to do lots of really bad things. Uh, so the mere fact that your speech might be used by someone else to commit a crime doesn't mean the state can ban it. They can ban the end product. You can't have a bomb, you can't have a gun, you can't ban poison, but they can't ban the information. Now, wait a minute, you say, Josh, that's a book, right? There's a difference between the book and these 3D printed gun files. Um, not so much. Uh, the courts have recognized increasingly over the decades that information is speech. And the mere fact that you choose to express yourself electronically rather than pen and paper doesn't deprive that information of speech. In a case called Sorel v. IMS Health, the court held that the creation and dissemination of information are speech. Creation and dissemination. It's not enough for me to speak. It's two-way street. There's the right to speak and the right to hear. And the government can't interfere with either aspect of that exchange. Uh, we are surrounded by data. We're surrounded by information. Um, I think this is a basic tenant of how our laws operate. Now that's the First Amendment. Let's talk a bit about the Second Amendment. Um, the Second Amendment provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, in 2008, in D.C. v. Heller, the court recognized that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms, not one tied to service in a militia. And two years later, in McDonald v. Chicago, uh, the court extended that right to the states. That is, the states can no longer violate the right to keep and bear arms. This is Dick Heller and notice McDonald shaking hands. I love this picture. Um, so far, the court hasn't said much on the Second Amendment. Um, all they've said is you have the right to keep a gun in your home. But I think I can make two arguments based on the Second Amendment. Um, the first, that the Second Amendment protects a right to acquire arms. 
you mean the right to acquire arms? The right to obtain a gun. Um, imagine a state, let's say California, passes a law that says, if you already have a gun, you can keep it, but you can't buy any new ones. So you have it, keep whatever you want, but you can't buy any new ones. At that point, uh, people can't transfer their guns. Eventually, there'll be none left when those people die or move out of the state or anything else. Uh, I think at a basic level, there's a right to acquire a weapon. Uh, 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 it could be by a regulation. They can have background checks. That's not my argument. But you have some right to acquire a gun. But on a more basic level, I think you have the right to make your own weapons. And here, I think I'm on a much stronger footing. Um, long before there were gun stores, if you wanted a gun, how'd you get one? You made it yourself. We have a very long history and tradition in this country of gunsmithing. Uh, back in colonial times, people had a musket that were homemade. Uh, people made their own ammunition, their own muskets. So there's a very long history, a tradition of making your own weapons, which is why, to this day, the federal government doesn't ban making your own weapons. In fact, California took a radical step by saying homemade guns needed to have a serial number. That was actually quite novel. I think California is the only state, maybe New Jersey also, that has such a regime on the books. Okay, so we have the First Amendment, we have the Second Amendment. But in some respects, they operate together with what's known as a hybrid right. Okay, what's a hybrid right? Let me give you an easy example. Let's say the state passes a law that said it's a crime to wish one a Merry Christmas, right? An actual war on Christmas. Would that law violate free speech? Or would that law violate the free exercise of religion? Or would it violate both? Um, and in many regards, I think it violates both. You have a prohibition on speaking about your faith. And banning someone from speaking about the faith violates the First Amendment speech and the First Amendment exercise. What do we have here? I think we have a hybrid problem. The state is prohibiting you from sharing information about how to bear, right, how to bear arms, right? They're prohibiting you from sharing information about how, to act, about how to exercise the Second Amendment. And in some regards, the court said that when you have these hybrid rights, these rights that reinforce each other, there's even greater constitutional scrutiny. I think that greater constitu uh, constitutional scrutiny means that you review these laws with an even greater, with an even bigger magnifying lens. And they really have to be narrowly tailored to serve the most compelling of interests. Okay. What laws are on the books now? We actually have a federal law that does a lot of what people are worried about. It's called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was passed in 1988. This law says that all guns must have a certain quantity of metal in them. Enough metal that would trigger a metal detector, magnetometer. Now wait a minute, Josh. Why was this law passed in 1988? I thought you said your guy invented plastic guns in 2013. Now, probably weren't even born in 1988, most of you, right? Um, plastic guns aren't new, right? Fears of undetectable weapons are not new. These are long-standing fears, and this proves it. Going back 30-something years ago, people were worried about undetectable weapons. Indeed, when the Glock handgun came out, right? This is a very popular weapon. It's made out of metal, but it has some sort of plastic components. And there was this fear that this Glock gun would be smuggled into courthouses and government buildings uh, past metal detectors, which is completely bogus. Uh, but that fear was even recognized in the Die Hard movie, right? My favorite character, Bruce Willis, John McClane. He said, luggage? That punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up in your airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Now, everything he said there is false, every word, okay? There is no Glock 7, that model doesn't exist. It's not made of porcelain, it's made of metal. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an airport x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. But still, there's always this fear among irrational politicians and Hollywood movie stars, right? That, <laughs> he's just reading a line, I don't blame Bruce Willis, that people are gonna smuggle in plastic guns to sensitive places. Okay, this technology has existed for a long time. Um, it's, it's, it's simply, it, it's largely a fantasy. It's a paranoia. Um, politicians love banning things that are new and scary sounding when there's actually very little public health reason to do so. Okay? So is there a ban on 3D guns? 
But we have the Undetectable Firearms Act, right? And the Liberator, as it's designed, has a block of metal in the handle. And that block of metal will make the, the, the Liberator comply with the Undetectable Firearms Act. Now, someone's going to ask me, Josh, what happens if you take out that block of metal? The gun will function just the same, but you'll be a felon. Um, but we do have a ban on these sorts of weapons. Uh, some people said, well, Josh, you know, it's so scary to have plastic guns. Let's just ban 3D printing altogether. Okay, good luck. Guess what? You're worried about plastic guns, banning plastics? You can 3D print metal, like Terminator style, right? You can actually 3D print a fully functional handgun. This was printed in a lab. It costs like $50,000, right? This is not a good way of spending money. They're very expensive, but you can do it. So then how did the feds go after my client? Had they go after defense distributed? They used export control law, which you probably have never even heard of. Um, but there's a regime known as ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. These are federal laws that prevent you from sending uh, certain types of munitions overseas. And this law makes a lot of sense. For example, if I want to ship a Stinger missile to Afghanistan, I probably need the government's permission to do that. I think we all agree. Uh, if I want to send the blueprints for a classified nuclear submarine to China, okay, I think we all agree the government probably needs to know about that and give you permission first. I think we can all go that far. But what happens if instead of putting classified information to foreign powers, you're merely putting a file, an open source file on the internet? The government has taken the position that putting an open source file on the internet is an export. That sharing a file on the World Wide Web is no different than sending China the blueprints for classified nuclear submarines. Um, the State Department has never before actually taken this position. In fact, we were the first time they ever did this. Congratulations, right? Uh, they never taken this position before. And indeed, uh, the Department of Justice has said in the past that you can't apply ITAR to public speech, to research, to academics. Imagine you're an academic, you're a professor, you're a grad student, and you want to share some of your work with colleagues in other countries, and it involves 3D printing, can the government say you need a license now to share an academic paper? What if you want to deliver research at a conference and there's some foreign students in the room? Do you have to ask them to leave? These are very dangerous positions the government's taken and the academy industry uh, hates them, but they hate us also, they hate 3D printed guns. So we are the worst possible plaintiff to advance this cause, but I will gladly advance the cause with whatever position we have. All right, so let's fast forward to my involvement in this case, where it gets a little bit more fun. Uh, in May of 2013, the State Department sent Cody Wilson a letter. And they said, you are in violation of export control laws, right? So, yeah, the dirty Diane, right? It's, it's, an, it's an oil filter silencer adapter, and they have to die in um, They said, you need to take down these files immediately. And just take a step back. I don't care what you think about plastic guns. Not really important to me right now. The federal government sent a letter to a US citizen demanding that he remove a file from the internet, an open source file that he created himself. Um, we thought that this action was illegal. So let's tell the story. Uh, around the same time this letter came out, I wrote an article saying that uh, there's a First and Second Amendment right to 3D printed guns. Uh, Cody tracked me down. He said, hey, I read your article. I liked it. I want to hire you to sue the government. I said, are you insane? He said, no, no just hear me out. And I, I heard him out. I think he actually had a decent case. He said, sign me up. Uh, I then joined a legal team that litigated this issue. In 2015, we filed suit against the State Department in federal court in Austin. And we asserted that they violated our rights to the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, also there was due process and some other administrative things which you don't care about. The district court denied our preliminary injunction. We then appealed the case up to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit split two to one and we lost. And the court said, well, there's not enough to grant a preliminary injunction now. Come back to us later. We then filed a petition for certiorari with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court denied review. Okay, so far we lose, we lose, we lose. We go back down to the district court. 
um, we actually are feeling pretty confident because instead of going up in a summary, I'm sorry, preliminary injunction, we'd be going through summary judgment, which is a much more favorable uh, uh, chance of success for the plaintiffs. But at that point, the State Department said, uh, you know, we've now determined that we're going to abandon this rule. We don't want to enforce against anyone and we're not going to enforce it against you anymore. So he said, let's settle the case. We're like, oh my God, that's awesome, right? Settlements are good. Everyone loves a settlement. Wait. So I'll give you the, the end before I get to the beginning. In the span of five days, I argued four temporary restraining order motions. We got sued across the country. So that's the end. Good like beginning. The settlement, was, the settlement was going to effect on Friday. Okay? Friday. That was a good deadline. On Tuesday, we get this frantic letter from gun control groups. The Brady campaign, Giffords, every town, all these alter egos of Michael Bloomberg, right? And they say... Uh, we want the court to block your settlement. Huh? And they filed this emergency TRO to block our settlement. They told the judge, if you allow the settlement to go forward, these files will go on the internet and all the people will die. So I had to go down to Austin, argue the first uh, temporary restraining order motion, and I actually won. I convinced the judge that these parties have no interest in the case, that the TRO should be denied. And it was. Now, at that time, Cody was planning to post the files about a week later. But I called him and I said, Cody, we have our license, we have our settlement, you post the files now. Get these things on the internet as soon as possible because these guys are going to sue us again. I don't know where, I don't know when, but I knew these guys were not going to leave us alone. And I decided we have to actually go on offense. Uh, so Cody put the files online. That was Friday night, late. And the entire weekend I spent preparing a new complaint. We were going to sue the Attorney General of New Jersey. He had been threatening us for several months, sending these demand letters, and we wanted to sue him in federal court to uh, assert our civil rights. Now. We were going to file this Sunday afternoon. We were all excited. We said, ha, we're going to beat him first. We're going to sue him first, right? And then about 20 minutes before we filed the complaint, I get this frantic email. The Pennsylvania Attorney General was suing us in federal court in Philadelphia. And he said, we want a TRO, an ex parte TRO, that is with no hearing, to block you from posting the files. And I told the lawyer, I said, um, we've already posted the files. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, they're online. They've been online since Friday. He's like, no, they're not. I'm like, yeah, they are. Check the website. Then he sort of just grumbled. So basically, they spent this entire week preparing a lawsuit that was moot before it even started. We posted the files. I told Cody, post it now. The judge came in on a Sunday afternoon and held a telephonic hearing that same day on Pennsylvania's motion. At the time, I was at the airport. This is a lesson for lawyering. I was at the United Lounge at LaGuardia Airport, and I, held, I did an oral argument from there. The worst possible spot in the country doing an, an, an argument. And I argued the judge, you know, there's, there's no jurisdiction, they have no cause of action, the files are online. And he told the judge, I was like, oh, Judge Russell, we've had no time to brief this issue. I learned about this lawsuit one hour ago. You know, I haven't had any time. I'll tell you what. I will voluntarily block Pennsylvania IP addresses. I, I was trying just to kill their case. I said, look, I'll block any IP address from Pennsylvania. That way people in Pennsylvania won't be able to access these files. And then we'll come back later. We have the time to brief it. We can't do this right now on, on an emergency basis. The judge like, you know what, that's fine. Uh, I'm Mr. Blackman's representation. I'm going to deny the TRO. They denied it. So I was like, oh, hey, sweet. I won in Austin. They won in Philadelphia. Uh, we weren't out of the woods yet. So I flew back home to Houston. And the next morning, we got sued again by New Jersey, the New Jersey Attorney General. Are you ready for this? He sued us in state chancery court. I'm not kidding you. Ready for this? He argued that putting a file on the internet was a nuisance. The same way if your neighbor's playing loud music, right? He argued that putting a file on the internet was a common law nuisance. And he asked a chancery court, ready for this? He asked a chancery court to issue a nationwide injunction to block a Texas company from putting a file on the internet. I really had to scratch my head on that one. And he wanted it ex parte, that is that in a hearing. So fortunately the judge in, in New Jersey, was Essex County, busy Newark, uh, denied the TRO, and he, uh, denied an ex parte, he said, look, we'll have a hearing the next day. So I stayed up all night briefing this case in New Jersey. And I had to argue this case in front of this chancery judge. Again, by phone. I was in Texas. I can't get there immediately. And um, <laughs> I told the judge, like, judge, with all due respect, you are a court of chancery. You don't have jurisdiction to issue a nationwide injunction. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Blackman, you're probably right. Uh, so we argued back and forth. And after this long hearing, the judge denied the TROs. I was like, okay, good. So I won three TROs. I'm feeling great, right? My winning streak would come to an end very soon. That same day, we were sued in Washington, in Seattle Federal Court, by eventually 20 attorneys general. 
including your lovely General Javier Becerra sued us. We, we, we tussle, right? Uh, they sued us seeking, again, a, a restraining order to block our settlement. They actually sued the State Department. We were brought in as necessary parties. I don't know why we're in the case, but they brought us in. And I argued that case. I said, Judge, again, I argued by phone. Uh, I, was, I was in Houston, the judge was in Seattle. I said, Judge, if you enter this injunction, uh, you'll be violating the First Amendment, you'll be restraining our speech. This is like the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, the judge wasn't interested. Uh, he asked me, I think, one question. The question was, uh, Mr. Blackman, do you represent all the parties? Okay, why would he ask that question? I'm going to rule against you, and I'll make sure I rule against everyone at once, and I'll have to issue a separate opinion later. So I knew we were going to lose. And after this long hearing by phone, uh, the judge in Seattle issued an injunction, a temporary restraining order to block our settlement. And I, I, I did something you're not supposed to. I said, Your Honor, may be heard. Usually when the judge issues this ruling, that's it. Everyone goes home. He was trying to get out. The judge may be heard. He's like, yes. I'm like, let me understand. Are you ordering my client to shut down his website? And he says, no, I'm not. So I said, judge, let me clarify. You're not supposed to do this, but I did it anyway. As a consequence of your ruling, my client's website is now illegal. And then the judge said, I'm going to paraphrase, he said, well, you know, sometimes anarchists break the law. So he took a shot at my client, which I didn't appreciate. So I, I clapped back, which you're not supposed to do. I'm a law professor, I don't care. Um, and, he, and I said, Your Honor, my, my client always complies with court orders. And the judge said, well, I was trying to make a joke. Uh, it's not funny. Um, so at that point, we lost. I had been in this roller coaster for five days. I had to argue four TROs. I worked 90 hours in five days. You can just do the math. Uh, I, I barely slept. I was up all night writing. Uh, it was a roller coaster. But then the hardest part of all of this was I had to call my client. And one day you'll be lawyers. You'll have to make a call to your client saying you lost. And this was hard. We've been really emotional. I called Cody. I was like, we lost. The judge ruled against us. Uh, you need to take down your website. Because at that moment, his website was in violation of the law. And I said, Cody, you got to take the thing down. He's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I got to take it down. And we, we actually were crying about it. It was actually it was quite emotional for us both. Um, and taking it down was, was, was not easy. Uh, he had all these firewalls and redundancies to keep the site up in case of an attack. So eventually, he was able to pull the site down. Uh, but we claim a moral victory, right? We claim a moral victory. By putting the files online Friday and taking it down on Tuesday, they're online for, for almost four days. These files are out in the open. They are in the ether. They're everywhere. We won. They lost, right? They tried to silence us, and we won. Uh, so I, I do claim a strong moral victory there that because we, put, we moved quickly enough, we got these files into the World Wide Web, and I, I'll be proud of that for, uh, for the rest of my career. Um, but the case certainly didn't end there, and it's still ongoing. Uh, we, we continued our litigation in Austin, and the trial court ruled against us. We've now brought another action in New Jersey against the Attorney General there. Uh, that's still pending. Uh, and this case basically goes on and on and on. Uh, I think at this point, we'll have appeals pending eventually from the Ninth Circuit in the Seattle case, uh, from the Fifth Circuit in our Austin case, and the Third Circuit with our, with our, with our Newark or actually, uh, Trenton, New Jersey case. Right, we have three appeals simultaneously. And it's my sincere hope and prediction uh, that the Supreme Court finds this issue worthy of taking. I think we will get some splits uh, on the issues and resolves a couple threshold questions, right? First, are these sorts of files uh, speech? Um, the court has sort of suggested the answer is yes. I think the answer is clearly and unequivocally yes. Uh, these files are expressive, they convey information, they're used to design files. Uh, other types of code, I think, probably aren't speech. If it's more like machine code or something that's much more mechanical. Um, okay, so if our, our information is speech, can the government prohibit it? Uh, I think the answer then, again, is no. Uh, even though the speech might be used to uh, make guns, the remedy for the state is to ban the gun itself, not to ban the files used to get there. Right? You don't ban the speech, you ban the end product. Oops. And I think that's a far better approach to resolve the issue. Uh, there's a third issue which I'm much more uh, optimistic about. Can the states regulate the internet? Now, your beloved home state thinks the answer is yes. They've tried to impose net neutrality and all these other laws. If there's anything that's interstate commerce, it's the internet, right? I, I am like the most narrow commerce clause person in this, in this probably this building right now. Uh, uh, but whatever the commerce clause means, it means the states can't regulate the internet. We have the dormant commerce clause. States cannot tell you how to, how to run an internet business in Texas. So I think a lot of these states, uh, these state laws are a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. I think also we have preemption issues. We have uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, 
which prevents states from imposing liability on internet content providers. Uh, it, it, it's up to the federal government to do this. So I think we have preemption. I think we have dormant commerce clause. I think we have vagueness arguments. These statutes are very vague. I'll give you an example. Uh, the New Jersey law makes it a crime to share information that may be used to make a gun. That may be used. So let's say I put online the blueprints to make a toy gun. I'm a cosplayer, right? I make a toy gun. And then someone hacks that file and makes it functional. I am now a felon. I made a blueprint for a non-functional weapon, which someone modified. I'll give you an even worse example. The statute applies in New Jersey to firearm components, like a nut or a bolt or a screw. So if I put online the files to make a screw and someone uses that to make a gun, I am now a felon. These statutes are way overbroad. They're void for vagueness. Uh, I think they're problematic from start to finish. So I think ultimately we prevail uh, perhaps on narrow grounds like dormant commerce clause or preemption which will leave the possibility that the federal government can do it. But I think we are on solid uh, First Amendment ground for free speech. Uh, I will keep litigating this case for the foreseeable future. I've been on it now for five years, and eventually I'll be on it. We'll get to a resolution, I hope, at some point. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you all so much, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Yes, I'm saying I, you get the first question. I, I, I say come back to you later. OK. Mm -hmm. showing. So the incentive is not monetary, right? Uh, defense distributed is not motivated by money, right? They're not trying to put these files online to sell them. Instead, the motivation is philosophical. Uh, they believe in the free exchange of information and that information should be free. They want this to be widely available. Uh, there's also a bit of a maker community. What do I mean by that? People like to modify and tinker. Right, so let's say I make a blueprint version 1.0, and then you take it and make improvements, make it 2.0, and then she makes other improvements, make it 3.0, right? That's how progress happens. You have this collaborative model. Think of like a Wikipedia, for example, right? We have different people moderating and editing and, and commenting to make a more refined product. So there are a lot of philosophical reasons. Let me make this point. Very few people who actually download these guns print them. Why? Because they're crap, right? They're mostly used for prototyping, to make a prototype, then you actually make the real thing out of metal. Uh, but this is done mostly for learning, for studying. Uh, indeed, these blueprints have been studied in universities. Uh, they've been displayed in art galleries and museums. There's a lot of literary, scientific, and, and, and cultural value to these files beyond actually even making them. In fact, most people never even bother making them because they're, they're, they're terrible guns. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Yeah. I have a question about the uh, ITAR. ITAR, yeah. So you were, you were talking about, you know, sharing something with China, nuclear code, with nuclear, having like a nuclear submarine or whatever with China, how that would be in violation. Yeah. Um, but putting something on the internet would not. I mean, what if you put how to make a nuclear submarine on the internet? Would that be in violation? Mm -hmm. Rather than sending it directly, you know, to China, mm -hmm. you just say, I, I, I know how to make a nuclear submarine, I'm putting it on the internet. Well, it's a good question, right? So the reason why I use a nuclear submarine as an example is because it's classified. And the courts have suggested that classified information has less protection as a matter of free speech. Whereas these blueprints are open sourced, right? They're, they're fully protected and there's no IP claims, right? There's no patent infringement as well. So it's not the method of communication, right? Whether I hand a thumb drive to a guy at the Beijing airport, right? Or I put them on a file so someone in Beijing can download them. The issue is what's, the, what's contained in the file versus how it's being conveyed, right? But if you just take a step back, in our case, when you're the crazy part, the court actually said it's perfectly legal to mail thumb drives, right? If you go online right now, you can order a thumb drive with these files. And if you're a US person, they can mail it to you. You can mail a thumb drive. You can't put it on the internet. You can't email it, because that might go over a foreign network somewhere to be hacked. So we're at this world where we have this World Wide Web, and the only way to share information is basically mail a thumb drive, which does not promote collaboration, doesn't promote exchange, and it's a very old school fashioned way. And I think that's, that's it's, it's a very hard thing to justify. So why were they saying it's in violation of ITAR? 
e electronic posting is illegal, not the thumb drives. Right? You, you, you can mail thumb drives, but you can't post electronically online. Even though it's not classified? It's yes. Th they've taken the position that uh, public speech, private speech doesn't matter. And we argue there's a big distinction between the private speech, like a classified blueprint, versus public speech. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just confused with the classified. Right? Like, so does ITAR only apply to classified? No, ITAR makes no distinction between classified and unclassified. In fact, but historically, ITAR has only been applied to private speech, classified stuff. It's never been applied to public speech. So if you're giving a paper in an academic institution, ITAR has never been applied to that. Yeah. But if, say, you work for like, you know, Lockheed Martin and you have the blueprint for a fighter jet, that would be more of a, a private nature. Yeah? So I've sort of been following this case since... You know, oh, great. Me too. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm curious, I mean, I'm, I don't know whether Defense Distributed is, is one of the companies releasing um, plans for, like, for example, registered drop-in auto sears, or whether that's somebody else who's using the same technology. But what issues are presented by not necessarily 3D printable guns, but for example, 3D printable weapons components, which convert, you know, for example, semi automatic into a FOIA? Sure. So, again, the plastic. Gun thing, I think, is a, is a boogeyman, right? Having a plastic gun is not a good idea. But what you can print is plastic components to be used with a metal gun. So, for example, you mentioned the receiver, right? The receiver is what makes a gun actually operate. And Defense Distributed has posted online uh, the receiver for an AR-15 semi-automatic weapon. Uh, I don't think uh, DD has done anything for automatic. I, maybe other groups have. I don't think DD has done anything with automatic. Uh, but then again, if you have a metal gun with a plastic component, um, that will be detected by metal detectors. So all the fears of smuggling plastic guns go away very quickly. Again, ammunition is also plastic. Uh, but, but the far more popular aspect is using uh, uh, these tools to home generate um, uh, 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 metal or plastic parts. Right? And again, California has now said, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the California law is you can make your own stuff at home, but it needs a serial number, which you can get from the state. Is my, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, you have to apply to the state. Do they, are they actually issuing these numbers? I don't know. Uh, people are trying with the like eight percent right. block lower kits. As far as I know, some people are just using their numbers. Oh, they have. You, you think That's they have? Yeah, I, I I don't know, but so my position is, as long as the state actually issues these numbers, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, New Jersey has said it's actually a crime to make it at home. Period. You have to be licensed at home as a manufacturer, which is basically impossible. You have to have like all these equipment and, and things like this. So I think actually, believe it or not, the California approach is optimal to the New Jersey approach, which is a flat out ban. I think the New Jersey ban is unconstitutional, which we'll get there. Thank you for that. Yes, in the back? Right. Um, well, I, I, get, I get the public safety arguments, right? The, these are files that people can use in the wrong hands to do bad stuff. Um, generally, the remedy in that case is to ban the end product, not the information used to get there. And I think we have a lot of press, and I mentioned the Anarchist Cookbook and other documents. Uh, so let's say, for example, I write a, a book right, that discusses how to be a hitman, right? Can they then ban the book? OK, another example. I give you step-by-step -step instruction on how to kill a specific person. Can they then punish me for my speech? Right? I think these are very different situations. You have to have, I think, an intent to actually help someone commit the crime. Merely posting files in the abstract that maybe you to commit a crime is too far. Think of it in crim terms. Are you intentional? Are you negligent? What's your mens rea? What's your state of mind? I think to have a prosecution for these speech crimes, you need to have a requisite intent. Uh, the New Jersey law is strict liability. There's, it's, it's, there's, there's no intent required. If you do it, you're a criminal. Right? If you put on online files for a toy gun and it's manufactured into a real gun, someone hacks it, you're a criminal. So I think you need to address your concerns. You need an intent requirement 
to make sure you're actually getting people who are culpable, but not sweeping in people who are, I think, innocent. Yes? Well, um, let me take it one step at a time. So why, why would people put files on the internet to do something that might itself be legal? For example, to have an automatic weapon. Um, they'll probably say, we, we find this fun to develop an engineer. Uh, I think that's actually the wrong question. Usually we don't ask people, why do you want to exercise a right? We ask whether a state is an adequate justification to restrict that right. Right. We don't ask people, why do you want to share this information? We ask, can the state then punish it? Um, so I don't know why people want to put on files that do this or that or the other thing. I don't really care. Uh, the question whether the state has an interest in punishing it. So uh, if the state wants to ban the modification of a weapon from semi-automatic to automatic, uh, I think under Heller, and that's our governing precedent, that's probably permissible. Um, but I think t teaching people how to do it in the abstract is something the state uh, uh, can't stop. So it's just at what level are you intervening? Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Um, this might be a really generic question, but is there any way they can regulate the vehicle needs to make the guns? Like, I know you said it's metal. The plastic, you mean? Uh, one is plastic, but you said that one's not this big of Well, you could, re you could restrict access to the materials used to 3D print. I think that'd be fairly foolish because that would then stop a lot of other people from 3D printing totally innocuous and harmless items. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good thought. Let me give you an example, right? So, has anyone ever tried to make a photocopy of U.S. currency, like a high-quality photocopier, like a Xerox machine? It won't work, right? On every piece of U.S. currency, there's little codes you can't see, these little dots, right? And if a copy machine picks up these dots, it'll just spit out an error message saying you can't uh, photocopy U.S. currency. So, they actually are uh, uh, the U.S. government's working with Canon and Xerox to build in um, devices that prevent uh, uh, counterfeiting currency. Well, if they did something similar, right? You try to print a 3D gun, and your printer has firmware or some sort of hardware that says, aha, this is a gun, I won't print it, right? And so you can't actually print the damn thing. I think that's a far more likely path than banning materials or anything else, because you can't print it. Uh, if you remember back in the day, if you had an old iPod that was locked down, you couldn't put certain kinds of music on it. They restrict what kind of music you could listen to. Um, of course, you can hack devices, right? You can hack the firmware. You can hack your iPod to get around it. Uh, so it, it won't go very far. But actually banning the materials, like limiting, you can only buy so much plastic in a given day, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you still have the speech issues, yeah. But thank you for the question. By the way, who actually cares about this is not uh, gun manufacturers, it's, it's designers, right? So. If I can 3D print a new pair of LeBron James sneakers for like $4, and it looks exactly the same way, why would I ever spend $400 on a pair of sneakers, right? Nike, they're petrified of this, right? They don't need sweatshops, you can print them at home. Uh, so if, if there's ever the sort of, uh, you can't print this on the device, it's gonna be fashion, it's not gonna be guns. Yeah. You're asking about the smart gun issue? Uh, micro oh, you've micro stamping, right? Uh, so if you don't if you don't know what micro stamping is, um, it's it's a technology that every time a bullet is fired, the firing pin imprints this little code like the numbers on the back of the shell casing. So that way, you know, you fire both bullet flies away, and they find the little shell casing, and they can then trace it back to your gun. Which might sound, oh my God, this is like CSI. This is awesome. Um, the effect of this would basically make every gun without micro sampling legal. Is that, is that a fair description? Well, you just, unless it's currently on the handgun roster, uh, new, new guns cannot be added to the roster unless they have the technology. Okay, so, so in other words, if you already have it, you get to keep it, you can't buy any new guns. So it would freeze in place whatever the roster of guns. 
Look, I... Uh, I think these sorts of laws, which have significant limits on the sorts of weapons that people would acquire, uh, are problems. You're freezing in place whatever guns exist today, and you can't add anything new in the future. Uh, and I think the, the, the ability of these things to actually solve crimes is untested. I think there's not a real compelling interest to have this. Uh, the reason they have these laws is to make guns basically impossible to buy. Uh, will manufacturers even make these micro stamp guns? Probably not. Uh, so that just, it contracts. Uh, the other issue I thought you were asking about these sort of smart guns, right? So what's this? Um, you know, in order to fire a gun, you used to put your finger, your thumbprint on the weapon to activate it. Or you need to like put a, you know, a code in. Or you need to like, you know, wear a bracelet with an RFID. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever wanted to like take your phone out and quickly take a picture? And you couldn't put your, your pin in quickly enough so you, you, you missed the picture. Okay. Right? How many people have tried to like, you know, on a hot day you're drinking iced coffee and then you want to put your fingerprint on the reader and it doesn't work? Okay. All the time. These are not precise technologies. With guns, seconds count. And imposing these sort of arbitrary restrictions, you have to put in a code or wear a bracelet or put your thumbprint. If it doesn't work, you're screwed. Right? So I think you really have to consider are these guns likely to impede the very thing the Second Amendment uh, is recognized to protect? Um, you know, even on the iPhone, there's a way to just sort of swipe up and take a picture quickly because Apple recognized you can't put the damn code in quickly enough to get that selfie in time. So if we can have, you know, rapid fire iPhone shooting, and then perhaps we have rapid fire gun shooting. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yeah. Start with Reagan. Uh, I mean, uh, the irony is the, the, the progenitor of most modern gun control laws in the state came from Ronald Reagan. Uh, in the 70s, when he was the governor, they imposed a lot of restrictions on concealed carry. Uh, why? <laughs> it was fear of the Black Panthers, right? The Black Panthers used to walk around the state capitol, not too far from here, uh, with basically rifles in their back. Because at the time, it was legal to open carry rifles, and they, they, were, they were doing their thing. So then the state enacted all these various gun control laws. So California is a very curious history uh, but at this point, um, I think with your new governor, uh, just about any gun law that passes will probably be signed in. Uh, Jerry Brown vetoed some of them. Uh, but I think it, you move to Texas if you want. We need more of you and less of other Californians. Right. If, in other words, uh, California thinks largely a lost cause. Um, with a super majority Democratic legislature and an anti-gun governor and the Ninth Circuit, unless the Supreme Court intervenes, whatever they want, they'll get. Come to Texas. I go back as quickly as I can. Anything else? All right, everyone. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Uh,